celebrate. It's only right. You see, this world is changing. Celebrate. We can help it change for the better. Celebrate, Dicer. Celebrate. It's only right. Celebrate. You see, this world is changing. Celebrate. We can help it change Celebrate. for the better. People of colors and ages, religions and lifestyles, and the disabled. Everybody should believe in diversity. Hi, and welcome to Diversity in the Community. I am your host, Teresa Freeman. Diversity in the Community highlights diverse people, cultures, talents, and subjects. I hope you enjoy today's show. He is the Chief Visionary Officer of an online magazine called Black Man Can. And he is here this year, as he was last year, to get us started in our program on today. So as he comes, let's clap our hands for him. Friends. Stop. And so, if you will, let's bow our heads. 
<laughs> Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain, and we thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for waking us up and allowing us to be here this appointed time. We pray for our young people. We pray for their hearts. We pray that they will be receptive and hear what you want to say through this particular session of this Teen Summit. Speak to us. Open up our ears and our hearts. Let us receive what you say. But give us our marching orders because we understand that you have called us with a purpose to do what you have created us and allowed us to be here on this earth. And so equipped us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so uh, just to give you a little bit more in depth, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I was born in Roxbury. I grew up on Blue Hill Ave. There's a Blue Hill Ave sometimes everywhere. <laughs> but there's a movie, and some of you might have seen the movie called Blue Hill Ave. And I grew up right down the street where that movie was shot. And so I, I wanted to also, along with prayer, just share a quick uh, philosophy. And it's sort of like a spoken word, but it speaks right to our hearts for this summer. And it goes like this. We are here because finally there's no refuge from ourselves. Until a person confronts himself in the eyes and hearts of others, they're running. Until they suffer to share their secrets with each other, they have no safety from themselves. They will be alone. But where else in this common ground can we find such a mirror? Here a person can at least appear clearly to themselves. Not a giant of the dreams, nor a dwarf of their fears, but as a young man and young woman with a share in their purpose. In this ground, today, this morning, we can take root and grow. Not alone anymore is in death, but alive to ourselves and to each other. We have a purpose. Thank you. And so I just wanted to share that with you because sometimes we come together and we only know why. And so I was just sharing with you, I grew up on Blue Hill Ave, man, and uh, they, my, the, the, the session and the purpose they wanted me to talk about was absence. And, 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 and I do want to ask some questions because I said that there's, 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 there's meaning, there's, 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 there's a definition in a word. And so I need to ask somebody, anybody, and don't be shy. Because if you was kicking it with your homeboy and homegirls, you'd be quick to tell them what they think they know and what they don't know. <laughs> and so I need to ask somebody, help me out. And this is okay, there's no wrong or right answer. But how many, is there someone that knows what abstinence means? Anybody? To go without. To go without. Anyone else? What does that mean to abstain, to be abstinence? Somebody. Sometimes, I, I know your, your parents, you want something and they say, no, what does that mean? <laughs> we don't like it. Any other definition? Abstinence. To refrain. To go without. To tell yourself, no. It is a word, uh, touch not, taste not. And if you don't, sometimes you want not. But how many of us know that a lot of times, in my experience, that a lot of things that I wanted, I found out later on I didn't need them. And so uh, to abstain, to refrain from, easier said than done. How many of us know usually the things that we know is not good for us is the things that sometimes we crave or want? Case in point, candy. Candy tastes good. That sugar is like a, 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 a adrenaline rush. We used to say like, like we'd be wrestling, right? 
and uh, in the middle of us wrestling a rough house and having fun, we say, hold it, let me take my vitamin. And I pop a piece of candy in my mouth. Am I the only one who should do that? But, but candy, and you know what candy will do. Someone tell me what candy will do if you eat too much candy. Someone say what? Sugar rush? Something else that candy will do. Uh, there you go. Cavities. <laughs> Cavities. Which is, you know, when we're young, we don't understand the meaning and the depth of fly now, pay later. So a lot of us are fly now, eat a lot of candy, but later on, the adults know we'd be paying for it when we get those cavities and have to sit in a dentist's chair and they have to drill your teeth and put them long needles in there to, to shoot that Novocaine in there. So, so there's some stuff, but uh, to abstain from that we know is more than, than just you know some other things that we think about to refrain from. And it's easier said than done. Because you might find me, I think I, you might find me with some candy in my pocket. But uh, I got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. And so I wanted to share a little bit about, about myself with you to give you an understanding why it's so important that we must refrain, we must uh, abstain, we must uh, practice abstinence because there's a high price to, to the high cost for that type of low living. There, there was a movie that came out, and it was called uh, Thin Line Between Love and Hate. How many seen that movie with Martin Lawrence? Well, that movie was about, uh, he saw something that caught his eye. You know how you see something that catch your eye? You all might go to the mall and see some sneakers that catch your eye. And, and, and you got to have them sneakers. And, 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 and you do everything, whether you go to work or you or you're just like nag you or, or just continue to go at your parents and say, I got to have them sneakers. And so he seen something that caught his eye. And, you know, he got his attention and uh, he started to uh, have a relationship with this woman that he didn't even know uh, her background of. He found out later on, and it, and, it, and, it, and it almost cost him his life. But his mother said something. His mother said something that, 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 that I hold dear. When I go and speak all over the country, and when I go into the prisons, I share that one line that she said. He was sitting down with his mother, and his mother said, Baby, a moment of pleasure could bring you a lifetime of pain. And man, that rang true to my heart. Because for some of us that have had some experiences, that have went through some things when our innocence was murdered, when we had that one moment that bring a lifetime of pain. And so, like, there were some things that happened when I was a little boy, at a young age. And, and you know, at the age of nine, I, I was in the church, and I, I, I used to play out front of the church. My house was right up the street, and I used to see this lady come, and, and she would shop, and she would pull up in a Cadillac, and it kept getting my attention. At that time, we weren't going to church. My family wasn't going to church. My father, he was very successful. He worked and he was a chief in the Coast Guard and, and, and that's a branch of service that back then, they didn't even welcome men of color. It was one of those that you had to take an equivalence test. The Air Force and the Coast Guard. You see I'm wearing this jacket and how many seen that movie, The Red Tails? Tuskegee Airmen just came out. Matter of fact, we should go see that movie because they didn't want that movie to be even made. They did everything possible for that movie to not be shot. They didn't want us to get any credit. They didn't want our history to be known. 
And it's a shame that young people don't continue to keep the legacy going, but to understand that we come from greatness. Not only you're going to achieve greatness, but our ancestors and our family members achieve greatness. There's things that's being done that God is working through us every day. But if we don't know, and we keep it silent, and we speak those words that usually are destructive and tear each other down subliminally, like that word we were talking about earlier, the N-word, but we won't hear and speak that we were, we were airmen and we were in the Air Force when they didn't even want us to fight in the war because of segregation. And so my father was in the Coast Guard and he was stationed in Boston and that's why I was born in Boston. My older brothers and sisters were born in Cleveland, Ohio. And so at the time my father, he became successful and at nine years old, my father had taught me how to work. We had a store on Blue Hill Ave called Rich Day. <coughs> and after not too long, he opened the store, he opened up a laundromat. And when they used to stock the shelves in the store, we had a two checkout lane. He would stock the, the shelves, and I would actually break the cardboard boxes down at nine years old. I would go into the laundry mat and give change. And so my mother and father taught me how to work. They taught me some morals and some values. They taught me some things that I would take later on and it would be implanted, it would help build my foundation. And so, like at the age of nine, I was taught how to work and earn some money. I would get allowance, but I earned my allowance. And then at nine, I remember my father was getting ready to lay down a carpet in the house so they would marble our, our floor and they had to break it up before they would actually put the insulin and lay the carpet down. And my father hired the guy across the street to help him. And this guy that was helping my father break the floor up and my father had me take the little barrels that he would fill up with the, the marble concrete, and I would take it out to the big barrel outside. And my father, in, in between, whether he was uh, being called to the base, or, you know, manning and managing the store, which my mother and him worked, and he had employees, he would come and go. And this guy that lived across the street molested me <coughs> at nine years old. I'm talking about that moment that not only brings a lifetime of pain, but when our innocence is murdered, even without our permission. See, the devil is roaming to seek who he may devour. He's trying to rob, kill, and destroy. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. But when we're in this world, there's some things that may even happen without our permission. And that's why it's important to not only be careful who you're around, who you listen to, but where you go. And it's very important because I experienced that when this happened, I didn't tell nobody. And it's important that we have a go-to person. That yes, we go to God, and it's okay. But we have somebody, somebody, that we can trust. And it may not always be that, that, that icon parent, but it's somebody that we can go to, that we can share our thoughts, we can share what's on our, in, in, in our heart, we can share our aspirations and our goals. It's important because this, this not only the enemy wants us to keep us divided, but it knows that we're vulnerable when we're by ourselves, and we invertly, and when we keep things secret, and we don't share, but we don't speak life into each other. And so I kept it a secret. And we have three enemies. We have the devil, and I spoke about that line. But we have the world. 
And I, that's why I said we're in the world because there's some things that's going on, man, because we're in the world that we're going to come in contact with. Let's keep it real. This is a youth summit, right? Can I be honest? Then let's be honest. And so, uh, not only that we're in this world and there's some things we're going to come in contact with, but then there's some things that we desire. This flesh. One of them I talked about is candy. And sometimes even when we know it's not no good for us, we know that some of the results and the damage that it'll do, we still desire. We still eat it. We still take it. Even when we got three pairs of sneakers and we can only wear one at a time, we still want another pair. I know I ain't alone. <laughs> Tell me this flesh don't desire some stuff that sometimes don't even make sense. So we got three enemies. And we got to know that. And we got to have a go-to person. We need someone to pray for us. Some of us did some things that we came in contact with because we're in this world and because of those prayers kept us from harm and danger. They used to say that when I was young that we need to be under the blood. <laughs> and we need to stay under the blood. And so I kept it a secret. And I didn't tell nobody. And I stuffed the feelings. And I held it in. I was afraid what people would think. I thought no one would believe me. I didn't have that go-to person. My father always worked. My mother worked. My older brother, he was hard on me. He wanted me to be him when he was like five and a half years older than me. I thought that I had to be a role model for my younger brothers and sisters. And so I kept it a secret. An impressionable bust metal pipes. Imagine what it'll do to us as human beings when we stuff the feelings and we don't tell nobody the internal wounds and damage that it does. That's why it's important that we tell somebody we release. Not always that it might be that traumatic, but that we can share our thoughts and that we can go to God. And you ain't got to have no deep prayer. You can have a conversation because that's what I do. Some people drive me down here. I said, all right, God. I'm going down here to Hartford. You know what you want me to say. So I'm going to get out of the way. And that was my conversation. And I was telling Brother Dow, I said, you know, regardless of what we're dealing with, regardless of what we're struggling with, God loves them with honesty. Contract means an honest and sincere heart. There's so many of us that, like myself, want to put on a mask and act as if we something that we're not or we're somewhere we want to hide behind the title. But how about when we're honest about not only who we are but what we're dealing with? That's usually when help can help us. And so, you know, I, I was telling Daryl, man, listen, you know, just be honest. Because that's usually when we be honest with somebody, we can get the help we need. And so, you know, I went on and I stuffed the feelings and I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this with you because a lot of times, you know, a lot of people tell us what not to do. But I'm trying to tell you what will happen if you don't do it. And then what do you do to prevent it? And how do you abstain from things that you may desire or want? But sometimes, why do you even crave them? Or why do you pick them up? Or why do you go to those places? Because we can tell you all day long. Like I said, easier said than done. But we got to go to the root. You can't bear no fruit until you go to the root. And so, at 13, I was working in the, in, the, in the store. We had an ice cream window. This is right on Blue Lab, right down from Grove Hall where they shot that movie. 
And my father at that summer hit, retired as the chief in the Coast Guard at 38 years old. I'm 13 years old. The XR70 motorcycles were hot back then. And I was working that summer to buy me one. And I was working in the ice cream window in the laundromat. That particular morning, it was the ice cream window. And we sold dairy ice cream and slush and hot dogs and hamburgers. And I was working. And I loved working with people. I'm a people person. I know how, how important it is to communicate, how to interact with others, how to share and relate. And so I, I was working in the ice cream window. My father, in this particular summer that he retired, him and his business partners, they were getting ready to open up a wholesale distributing company. My father, at this particular time, owned the largest minority security agency, 45 security guards in the city of Boston in 1974, where it was hard for a man of color to even get a car loan on three businesses. And he was getting ready to open up this wholesale distributing company. That's all I knew at 13. I was going to school. I was at MECO. MECO's a program that if you live in Boston, you get on a, uh, you take a test and you get on a list and hopefully you can go to school out in the suburbs. Because back then, Segregation and discrimination was bad in the city of Boston. So the parents and young people were trying to go to school out in the suburbs. And I was fortunate to go to school in Cohasset, near Hingham, where they used to have an amusement park called Nantastic Beach. And it was outside. And uh, matter of fact, my girlfriend, her, her, her father owned all the red line ends and she used to bring a horse up after school where I could ride a horse in the soccer field before the bus came. So that speaks volumes. My girlfriend, bring a horse. <laughs> Here, Cedric. <laughs> all right, thank you. You know how we do. We don't want to act like it's a big thing, you know. Post to. And so I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm working in that summer, and they came to the store. And I don't know what happened or transpired, but my father ran out the door, and then someone ran in and said, Mr. D just got shot. And my father, we had a store that had an office that looked over the whole store, and it was glass. And he kept a shotgun hanging on the wall. And when they said Mr. D just got shot, I wanted to do something. I don't know about you all, but when your innocence is murdered and things are happening without your permission, this least this piece that I said, I got to do something. That's my father. It's my role model. That's my power example. That's the one that I thought would bring me. It's going to bring me from my adolescent age into manhood. And I ran in upstairs and grabbed the shotgun because I wanted to save my father. He just got shot. And I ran downstairs, and some of the, the employees and customers wrestled me to the ground. And while I was laying on the ground, I don't know about you all, but there's a lot of things, especially young men, that we don't talk about. We don't share with our mother or our sisters or our girlfriends. But sometimes we don't even share with each other. And I had some information. I call it misinformation by misinformed people. What a man looked like, what a young man smelled like, and what he think and what he act like. And when I was on the ground, I said, I'm not going to get up and let them see me cry. I'm going to stop the feelings. I got to be a man. I got to show them I'm a man because I'm tough. That's my father, and I got to walk in his shoes. And I did like when I was nine. When I was molested, I stuffed the feelings, and I got up, and I said, get off me. And I held the feelings inside. And I walked outside, and I watched my father. The ambulance was called several times. 20 minutes went by. My father bled to death in front of me when I was 13. My role model, my power is Things that happen because I'm in this world. 
And I told myself, because a lot of times, yes, misinformation by misinformed people, but it's what I tell myself is what I do. So when I tell myself, I'm not going to touch it. When I tell myself, I'm not going to do it. When I tell myself, I'm not going to get it. Usually I don't. But when I tell myself, I'm going to smoke it. When I tell myself, I'm going to taste it. When I tell myself, I'm going to touch it. Usually I do. And so, I acted out every opportunity I got. I'm talking about when pressure, when the wounds, when, when, when the trauma, when the innocence, when, like where did it come from? And usually when I see young people, that's why I go any opportunity when it comes to the young people, because I can identify. But when I see young people that do some stuff, or even sometimes, when, even, when they, even when usually their track record, they're decent and they're doing what's right most of the time for the right reasons, but sometimes they do things and you ask them, why do you do that? They say, I don't know why. I don't know. I can identify. And I acted out every chance I got because I stuck the feelings. And there were some things going on inside that I wouldn't talk about. I wouldn't tell nobody. And I said I'm not going to tell nobody. I didn't want them to see that I was hurt. I didn't want them to see that I felt abandoned that my father had left me. Even though it wasn't his fault. But daddy, how dare you do that? You were supposed to bring me into my manhood. I wasn't going to tell nobody. But if I thought you'd seen how I really felt inside, I was afraid the fear. Because the enemy, the disease, the flesh, the world lives and thrives off of fear. And if I was afraid you would see how I felt, I would act out. And I'd do things that I would say, I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I'm hanging with him. I don't know why I picked that up. But usually it was because I was afraid the fear of how I felt, and I wouldn't tell nobody. And I kept it and held it inside. And what you would see is the external, the external, the results of me acting out on the outside. But usually it's what's going on in the inside that creates the behavior on the outside. And until I deal with the things on the inside, I continue to do things on the outside, even when there's times when you say, why do you do that? And I'll tell you, I don't know. Why are you running with him? Mm -hmm. And so, there's some things that happen, and I gravitated to, because of the pain to the things on the outside. And let me tell you something. Usually, when we have an inside spiritual problem, nothing on the outside will be the solution to that problem. Nothing. I don't care what it is. I don't care how much money they got. I don't care what party's going on. I don't care how strong the ooey is. Nothing on the outside is going to fix an inside spiritual problem. The only thing that can and will and has is God. Yeah. And God usually don't come like 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 sometimes because he may. But you know how we are. Oh, here we go. Here we go. We come along and oh. No. <laughs> God may come through my friend that's open and receptive from God that he sends. God may come through the person that I go to to share my thoughts. God, when I ask in a prayer, God, I'm hurting or I'm confused and the test is driving me to the point where I'm thinking about 
doing what I see them down the block because it's overwhelming. And I don't know if I'm going to pass this test, but I know I can go pass by and get a drink. And by me telling God that, <coughs> usually, most of the time, all the time, God is sent to hell. That's why he loves an honest heart. That's why he loves for us to be real. Keep it 100. <coughs> you can keep it 100 with God. Yes. And you know what? I kept it so 100 with God, I told God I'm mad at you. You took my father. I'm mad at you. And all that good gravy stuff I'm hearing about you, I don't feel that right now. And I believe that when I'm honest like that with God, even though I believe and I thank God for everything because everything was necessary for me to be where I'm at today, he heard me. He heard my honest heart. And so I gravitated, man, and I started picking up everything on the outside and acting out. <coughs> And moments of pleasure brought me a lifetime of pain. How many know that there's, how many heard of hepatitis C? How many, how, there's a couple other ways, especially with teenagers, they don't talk about it. Information is important. But without information, right, without application, brings frustration. But first you gotta get the information. Then you got to apply. Because some of us got information, but we don't apply it. So that's why we all over the place. And spiritually, our spirit is cluttered. How many know another way? Especially something that teens like to do. Huh? There's two other ways to contract hepatitis C. Tattoos that they don't even talk about. It's one of the highest rates that now young people, teenagers, are being contracted with hepatitis C. That is a blood virus that attacks your liver. It's one of the organs that once it's shut down, you can't live without. They don't tell you that. They, the fathers come on in here. Oh, look at my girlfriend. They don't tell you about some of the cons. How the enemy can come through that tattoo. Yeah. You can live without your heart. You can have an artificial heart. You can be brain dead and it still keep you alive. Right? right? Your kidneys could be shut down and get diabetes. But when your liver goes, and young people are contracting hepatitis C at an alarming rate to tattoos. What's another way to contract hepatitis C? There's one more. That young people are getting 24 7. <laughs> yes. Uh, needles. That's blood to blood, but there's one more. Sex. Huh? Sex? No. <laughs> Very rarely you can contract hepatitis C <laughs> through sex. Now, there's other transmitted diseases through sex. <laughs> so, we're going to touch that. But hepatitis C and the importance and reason why I'm talking about this because the alarming rate that young people are contracting hepatitis C and they're not talking about it. The other is piercings. Piercings. That's the other way and one of the alarming rates that young people are now contracting hepatitis C that attacks your liver through piercings. Tattoos. And piercing. So you ain't got to do blood to blood. It's no more that, you know, oh, I don't use needles. I ain't no drug addict. The enemy, the, the devil, he's a roaring lion seeking who may devour, to rob, kill, and destroy. Just keep it real. <coughs> you said we can be 100. And so there's some other things and other ways that you can transmit other diseases that we must abstain from. But a lot of times we don't talk about the real consequences. Like you see the videos. I'm going to get out of the way in a minute. You see the videos, right? 
And I, I, listen, you're talking to someone who lived those videos. I'm talking about when you see the videos and the rappers are rapping and they're on the yacht. Matter of fact, Daryl and uh, John is here. I used to rent a yacht and have a party for a recovery community every year. No alcohol and, and, and liquor and uh, uh, drugs, but that was part of my forte. Lived in California, lived all, in out the country. You know how we'd be in the wilderness and the devil will set you up and have you thinking you live in large. The higher up you are, the harder the fall. And so those videos, you see them, they party, they popping champagne and champagne. Listen, they got the cognac, man, and they. Uh, <laughs> and you see them in the girls. And, <laughs> and they on the yacht, they got the bling bling. But you don't see the other side. You don't see the side that Cedric had got cirrhosis of the liver. You don't see the side that it gets out of control because they get abstain and because it look good, taste good, and smell good. The end results. You just seen the video. But you didn't see the whole tape. And that's what we're going to do, play the whole tape. And I'm one that lived that tape. And I believe that I speak the truth into other people's lives, they know the tape. It's important to get the information. It's important to get the wisdom and the knowledge. Some people say, I got experience, but I need to get the knowledge. How many of us know that if you don't read the fine print, you ever had something that you had to read the fine print to know what it is or instructions and you don't read it? Well, you ain't got the knowledge. That's right. Now, when you finish putting it together and it ain't right, you might have some experience, but you ain't got the knowledge to do it. There's a difference between knowledge and experience. That's why it's important that we go to school, increase and upgrade our education so we can get the knowledge, so we can get it right. Um, I believe that there's some others that's going to talk briefly about some of the other ways that you can uh, uh, contract other diseases. And someone touched on it with the uh, sex. But how about when you don't just touch not and taste not and want not? I tell people this all the time, and I and, and, and I didn't live it, but I experienced and I know it now as really as part of my ritual. Good ways get good tips. So if I wait, if I wait on God, if I wait, even when I want it, even when I think I got that habit, but if I wait, sometimes when I process things, because I wait and I weigh it out. And I think about it, usually I find out I don't need it. And I really don't want it. Then if I wait long enough, I find out if I had got it then, it would have interrupted what God has for me now. Good ways get good tips. And so years later, because when I was a little boy and I was going to church and my whole family came and it, my family got saved, I have four other uh, brothers and sisters that are now ministers. My mother is a missionary. <coughs> the little boy that I told you would be playing outside and see the lady pull up in the Cadillac. And I went up to her and I asked her, even though the things happened afterwards, and I went out into the wilderness, there was a calling and a covering. There was some prayers. I was kept under the blood. And I asked her, I said, can I be your bodyguard? And she smiled and said, yeah, you can be my bodyguard. I'm talking about nine years old, didn't know this lady. And she was one of the ministers at the church that would pull up and me and my friends would be playing uh, softball and kickball. And then when she would come, I would stop playing and I'd tell them, I gotta go to work. And they said, go to work. I said, yeah, I'm on a bodyguard. <laughs> so some of us, where we think that when we go places or 
we're in church or we hear things even from our educators, our teachers, and we think it's cornball. Or you can say, man, this is cornball. Or we feel like it's useless or meaningless. We don't understand the depth and the height, the level and the deposit that it has and the impact that it will determine and make in our lives years later. Today, today, somebody say today. Today, today God had told me, showed me in a dream. He showed me I was in this stadium, this arena, and it was all these people sitting in the stadium. This was six years ago, seven years ago. I was a director of a program in Boston. I had just finished doing nine to 15 years for trafficking. I'm talking about being in that wilderness. I'm talking about playing the whole tape. I'm talking about the devastation, the devil, the world, the flesh had a contract out of my life. And seven years ago, they gave me six months to live and my liver had started to shut down because all the damage, the video, of them popping the champagne, the party, wine, women, and eat, drink, and be merry. Fly down, pay later. A moment of pleasure will bring you a lifetime of pain. And at the pinnacle, when I'm a director now, they came and got me four years prior. I was in the pre-release. They said, we heard about you. I could go in any project. Any housing in Boston, you if you don't live in that project, you can't walk through that project. But I had a reputation. I did 9 to 15, I had an empire. The devil had set me up only to fall. I didn't tell him nobody. And so they said, you would be the one. God sent us. It was a, a minister, Reverend Richardson, and said, we need you. They contacted me in the pre-release. And they said, we want you to run this program. And God had used me as a vessel because I said yes. Built it up to four sites. Worked with high risk gang kids. Young people. People just like me. To speak words into their lives. Encouragement. Life. To encourage instead of discourage. And at the pinnacle, four years later, I'm the director writing grants and Built the program up where it was a quarter of a million dollars a year. All through the city of Boston, going to the, not only the, the courts, but also meeting with the commissioner and the judges, and they would release them out of prison. DYS. And I would put them in school, I'd do a holistic development with the family and the young people. And my liver started to shut down when I least suspected to. Fly now, pay me. I remember when I was living in California, and I heard they had some strong purple dope in Tijuana, Mexico. Guess where I was the next day? In Tijuana, Mexico. Fly now, pay later. And so they rushed me to the hospital. Yeah. They said, your liver is going from cirrhosis to legions. You got six months to a year to live. You need to get your house in order. And then fear kicked in because even though I had this reputation and image and it's okay, put the mask on, fear kicked in and I had to ask God for the courage. How many of us sometimes, even when we're going to take a test, ask God for some courage? Yes. And I say, God, give me the courage to walk through the fear. And I started treatments and so that six years ago I had that vision, that dream. And I was sitting in the audience, and he said, you have what they have, but I'm going to heal you. I was bedridden for three months. I couldn't get out of the bed. I was in so much pain, I had to move in with my niece so she could watch me while I take and inject the, the, the treatment and take all the medicine. And I was, my brain was even hurting. It would take me four days to fall asleep. I would be looking up in the ceiling. I kept the TV on because I said if I heard the TV, I moved out. And tears would come down my eyes. And after four days, I'd get so tired that I'd get a two-hour sleep only to go on a four-day run again for three months. And I said, God, if you get me 
off this deathbed, if you get me off this bed, if you heal me, I'll serve you and I'll help others. That was seven years ago. I got a little better. I had that vision. I took another treatment and it got worse. I had to take injections every day. It got worse. So in the midst of them saying, you're dying, I had the dream. But I had faith. And the dream said, I'm going to heal today. Today. I've been to the doctor Monday. Got my results Friday after doing this new treatment. They said your liver is healed back to normal. It's okay to clap for God. So the hepatitis C undetected. But I'm sharing this with you because unless we deal with those things that draw us and look for the outside things that we must abstain from, these are the things that can happen. Absence is important. Absence is vital. And if we wait on God, good waiters get good tips. And then give us not only what we need, but later on, if you be a good student, they'll give you what you want. Thanks for that mission. Right. We want to thank Brother Dennis, uh, Cedric Dennis, for sharing out of the depths of his heart. We can give God another hand of praise for us.